hi, folks. When I was first invited to TED Talk with you kind folks today, I knew exactly what I was going to talk about. I had this super unique story of being a Jersey girl turned hobby farmer. I was going to tell you all about how the gifts my farm produced, the fruits and veggies, the milk and the eggs, not to mention the muscle strength and the bone strength from all that physical labor, how those gifts prepared me for a sudden and traumatic battle with breast cancer. And you would have loved it, trust me. If I had given it back when I was originally scheduled to give this talk in March of 2020. <sighs> but as I was looking over this talk again to share with you today, I realized that some of the stories, some of the advice that I was going to give, it's stuff that you've already learned. Uh, for example, I was going to tell you to uh, be flexible because, and this is going to shock you, at some point something big might happen that changes all of your plans. I was going to tell you that the farm taught me that life requires movement, moving the soil, moving our bodies, and that we need to get as much momentum as we can while we can, because at some point, somebody might tell us that we're not allowed to move at all. I was going to tell you this really adorable story about how I saved my goats from a barber pole worm infestation with the use of ivermectin. <laughs> so as I was looking over this talk to join you again today, I realized that more so than, than exercise and nutrition and medication, though to be fair, without any one of those things, I might not have made it to this stage today. But more so than those things, what the farm taught me that saved my life was fear or rather, how to live in and around fear. Spiders. I hate spiders. No, I fear spiders. Because of course I do. It's in our DNA. It's in our evolution to fear spiders. And I'm not just saying that either. In 2017, researchers from Germany, Austria, and Sweden took six-month-old infants and exposed them to pictures of snakes and spiders and measured the baby's pupil dilation to determine that, yep, babies are freaked out by the creepy crawlies too. Oh, I know, right? I want to know how they got that past the IRB. <laughs> so the researchers determined that these babies were protected by their fear instinct because they crawled along the floor at snake and spider bite level. So they were being protected from a real ancestral threat. And plenty of us have held on to that fear instinct. We've held on to that protection against that ancestral threat. On our farm, there was one particular kind of spider that was everywhere. It's called the rabid wolf spider, a terrifying name for a relatively docile creature. These guys are big. They don't bite, they're not venomous, but they can jump high, directly at your face. Yup, right? And so that's how I met my first or I met my first one. I was in the barn organizing some wood and I saw some strange markings on a two by four, so I leaned in close to check it out, and BAM! Giant spider directly in my face. And then the running and the screaming and the match striking and the preparing to set the barn on fire. And when I realized that burning down the farm would be an unwise use of our investment, I realized that I would have to learn how to live with these spiders. If I was going to stable my horses and milk my goats in this barn, if I was going to raise my chickens and collect their eggs in this barn, I would have to learn how to live with these spiders. 
fear, the fear instinct is at its core self-preservation. When we're fearful, we live within pain and an anticipation of death so that we can avoid those things from becoming a reality. When I was about 25 years old, I was what you might call a hippie, a greenager, a granola gangster, a Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> I was, like many 25-year-olds, deeply invested in environmentalism. I worried about our planet's decline, and I feared what it would mean if I was, at least in part, responsible for that decline. Uh, it, at that time, my husband and I were relatively new in our marriage, and as our most uh, new husbands, my, John was wonderfully supportive of my passions and far more trusting that I could do the things I said I could do than he probably should have been. It was around this time that books like No Impact Man were being published. And all throughout the media, we were hearing stories about families who were striving to live a carbon-neutral lifestyle. I knew I could do that, too, because I was an enviro-Nazi, an eco-evangelist. I have an aunt, a true flower child straight from the 1960s, who in her mid-20s moved to India and built a rainforest. I'm not kidding. Her name is Pamela Maholtra, and you should totally check out her TED Talk. So I took my family and we built our own little rainforest on a 16-acre plot of land in a little mid-Missouri town. We brought goats and horses and chickens and gardens to this land. I raised two boar yearlings, boar goat yearlings, for meat. And when the truck took them away to be slaughtered, I cried and I wailed, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. And then I decided to raise milking goats instead. It took about 10 years for me to learn how to live not on, but with my farm. I'd learned patience and consistency. I'd learned to live with the cycles of the seasons. And then, at age 35, the worst happened. I was diagnosed with breast cancer, invasive ductal carcinoma stage 2b. My treatment consisted of 23 weeks of chemotherapy, Six weeks of radiation, a double mastectomy with reconstruction. Because my cancer was hormone-fed, I had to have surgery to have my ovaries removed. And as a parting gift, I get to take a daily chemotherapy pill and receive IV infusions every six months for the next 10 years. I lost a tooth to chemotherapy and had to have the root removed, the last oral surgery I'll be allowed to have, because any more might break my jaw. Fear. So much fear. I feared the pain, and it was painful. I feared an early death, and that still hangs over my head today. You see, I went into this farming thing thinking that I was going to save the world through big, overt lifestyle changes and movements. And that wasn't only true for my farming and for my environmentalism. That was true in every aspect of my life. I thought that in order to make my mark in the world, I would have to do big things. I'd have to live up to all of those toasts I got at graduation dinners. I'd have to write a book that would be taught in classrooms someday. I'd have to earn an international reputation in my field, make all the money, get the best job at the best university, which, by the way, done that. <laughs> but when I was staring down the barrel of cancer at age 35, I had to think about my mark in much smaller contexts. I had to think about what it meant if I had already done everything that I could do to make my mark. I started to realize that the future was not mine to pursue. I started to think about 
those small contexts in terms not only of the mark that I was making, certainly I thought of the mark I made on my children and my husband and my mother and my family and friends, but even smaller than that, I started to think about things like, was my desk clean enough for my family to go through it if I was no longer here? Were my lesson plans clear enough for a colleague to take over if they had to? It wasn't that I was planning for my death, but rather that I was starting to understand that the future was not mine to pursue. Philosopher Simone Weil calls that being snatched away into eternity. Weil says that when pain and weariness reach the point of causing a sense of perpetuity to be born in the soul, through contemplating this perpetuity with acceptance and love, we are snatched away into eternity. My cancer experience gave me an abundance of pain and weariness. I lost everything that made me feel powerful. I lost my strength. I lost my cognitive abilities. That's called chemo brain, and I still have it. Chemo caused my cuticles to rip down, or my nails to rip down to the cuticles. And so even doing simple tasks like lifting laundry from a washing machine or opening the refrigerator door were excruciating. Before my chemotherapy experience, every so often, death would actually feel enticing. When the fear of doing life wrong got really, really big, when I feared not making my mark, or worse, making the wrong mark, I would occasionally wonder, what would it be like if I wasn't here? What if I'd never been born? What if I exited now and let the earth and the people around me heal from the messes that I'd caused? While I was going through chemo, that fear became palpable. One mid-November night, a person very close to me in my family went out into his garden bench after a very, very prolonged and painful battle with his own cancer, and he ended his life. Two weeks later, a dear, dear friend of mine, an Army veteran, walked onto the steps of a local police station and lost his battle with PTSD, leaving behind the most beautiful and faithful family I've ever known. At that same time, a child in my family, one of the most precious lights in my life, was hospitalized for trying to end it all too early as well. I remembered a story that this medic had told me once. He told me that the military uses goats for what they call live tissue tra trauma training. They anesthetize the goats and they practice operations and trauma responses to prepare for the battlefield. And this medic, he told me that they use goats because of all of the animals, they really make the medics work hard because they have the lowest will to live. But that, that had not been my experience with goats. My goats mourned babies who didn't make it. They cried when their companions were taken from them. And let me tell you, they feared danger, and they avoided it. If you've ever seen a field of grazing goats, and one goat just happens to look in one direction, all eyes will turn in that direction, looking for the danger. And then when there is none, they look at that guy and go. It seemed to me that Every animal on the farm was there to survive. Survival was their goal. Even those spiders, even those spiders were there to survive. At some point, I learned that the rabid wolf spider is a warrior who battles the truly dangerous arachnids, the dreaded brown recluse, whose bite can be dangerous and, in very rare occasions, even deadly to humans. So this spider that I had been fearing so long had actually been protecting me. In my pain and weariness, I could see the perpetuity of the farm. The farm would perpetuate 
even though I would not perpetuate with it. I was falling apart, but the farm would continue to survive long after I had turned to dust. It didn't need me, but it had had me, and I had had it. And once I was able to embrace the perpetuity of the farm, the continuity of the farm, in light of my own death, whether that death happens soon or at some point in the distant future, I started to recognize every little mark that contributed to this farm's eternity. Every seed that fell fed my family and my animals and then died. Every animal that was born contributed to the shape and the spirit of the farm, whether they lived for years or were gone before their first sunrise. When we think about that perpetuity, we have an opportunity to realize that these animals, this farm, does not need a reason to survive. It doesn't need to know its mark. In order to make your mark on the world, all you have to do is be in the world. And to be in the world means to experience pain and weariness. And if we can, if we can embrace those experiences as part of our contribution to eternity, we might be able to recognize that as long as our own little personal farms perpetuate, a piece of us will perpetuate as well. Thank you. By the way, I was told that I should tell you that this is actually me doing this little crazy dance, and it's, it's a Rihanna video. Well, do you remember what the Rihanna video is? <laughs> What's it called? I don't know. Anybody recognize it? I forget. It's Rihanna. Google it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>